forward. OK, so pooling variants. So we start with a couple words. We're going to attach it to other ideas. So when we say pool variants, what things are true? What assumptions are we making? Why would we make those particular assumptions? Are we throwing variants into a pool, like literally? No? Why do we call it pooling variants? OK, you're combining the variances. <coughs> what, other, what else is true about them? If I say I'm making the assumption of pooled variants, what am I assuming? What's equal or not equal? Are the variances equal or unequal? Approximately equal. If I'm saying, in this case, I'm working under the assumption of pooled variance, I'm assuming that the variances in my two groups that I'm assuming are independent are equal. And by equal, I mean approximately equal. We went over some rules of thumb about when pooled variance actually might be useful. What were those situations? Okay, both sample sizes are less than 10. There's mo two more conditions that go with that. Hmm? Pretty close to each other, right? That was kind of the ambiguous one where you're like, well, you're probably not going to say 9 and 1 or 9 and 2 or 9 and 3 are close to each other. But if you're already working on the assumption they're both less than 10, maybe we can say they're within one or two of each other, something like that. What was the third piece? You don't get two, something like that. Okay, so if I look at my estimate of my variance, S1 and S2, right? Um, when you divide S1 by S2. Okay, so this ratio is less than two. And so what this says, if I have a fraction, if I have two numbers A and B, and I take A divided by B, in this case it's saying neither one of them is twice as more than twice as large as the other one. Right? That's what this constraint means. Um, so we can and so that is pretty generous, right? Again, that could, and of course this is just in practice, these are rules of thumb that are reasonable to follow. But the number of situations in which that comes up, you know, they might be relatively small. Um, what I mentioned was if you can, try to, try to get your sample sizes large enough so you don't have to start worrying about these kind of situations. Um, Okay, so with pooled variance, so we've talked about a couple of things uh, in the last two weeks that are conservative assumptions versus, right, so we have the t-test versus the z-test. Which one of those is considered the more conservative test to use? The t-test. Why is the t-test more conservative? So, yes, it's true you use it for smaller sample sizes, but what about the t-distribution makes using it more con a more conservative option than using the z-distribution? Okay, fatter tails. Okay. The question, what does fatter tails do? So, if I have these, if I have these two curves, right, the z-distribution and the t, and I overlay them, I have to have a larger critical value if I'm working within the t-distribution than I do in the z-distribution. So if I have like a 1.97 uh, z-value, right, that's outside, that would meet my point where I can reject, for example, the null hypothesis at a 0 0.05 level. That same level of evidence in the t-distribution is probably more about 2.1. 
or 2.15. Okay. So that's more conservative. When it comes to pooled versus unpooled variance, which one is the more conservative assumption? Unpooled, which unpooled is another way of saying we're assuming these things are not equal to each other. And that comes back to a degree, the degrees of freedom, where, and of course, I'm not going to expect you to know, <laughs> memorize these degrees of freedom, but generally speaking, we said in the case of the pooled variance, we are going to use which one? So I'm going to put a couple of Which one goes with which for degrees of freedom? Which one's for the pooled variance? Which one? Which one's for the pooled variance? This is for pooled? Okay. And since we have only one other option. Okay. What happens when we're dealing with um, the heat distribution? If we have more degrees of freedom, what happens to the heat distribution? It gets closer and closer to normal, right? Which makes the tails skinny, right? So you have to have a less extreme critical value to reject the null. So when you think about take, deciding how to approach doing these tests, you're more concerned, unless you have reason to believe otherwise, a t-test with unpooled variance is going to be a good direction to go. Now, if you have reason to believe that you know the population standard deviations, and you have reason to believe that the variability in these two groups is approximately equal, then you can go that direction. But just understand, if you use the t-test and the unpooled variance, you are requiring a greater burden of proof from your data than you are if you make these other assumptions. And it's in making these assumptions that you can think about where data and conclusions might get played around with. All right, let's say you run, you're right on the borderline. It's certainly possible if you're right on the borderline with a um, t-test with unpooled variance to run it with the assumption of equal variance and under normal distribution, it's going to change your p-value a little bit. So. Be conscious of these things. Um, and again, our, the other key parts from Monday, which were also part of the week before, we can run through and do our, our hypothesis test and everything, but we can also use confidence intervals to make a determination of what, what we would do in terms of our null and all alter the alternative hypothesis. So if I, let's say that I come up to you and I say, okay, we're running this, um, we're running this test, this hypothesis test, and I'm going to do it at a significance level of 0.1. Okay, not our standard 0 0.05, but 0 0.1. And so you should be asking me, or if you're reading a paper where this is said, what kind of confidence intervals should you be looking for? in order to make a quick determination about what happened with the hypothesis test. How, what percent confidence intervals should you have? I said 0.1. And we need 90% confidence intervals. Okay, so think this, this is a very easy mistake to make that you, because we're so used to looking at 95% confidence intervals, if you have a test that's being done at 0.1, you need 90% confidence intervals. If you have a test that is being done at a level of 0.01, you need 99% confidence intervals. Um, the standard is going to be that it's done at 0.05 and you have 95% confidence intervals, but this is something that is very easy to miss. So if you were presented with a situation, like in an upcoming quiz, be aware of what is stated and not stated. If on, this, on the quiz for this weekend, I'm going to mention a couple of times where I say things, statements about a confidence interval 
In some cases, I include a statement about the percent. In some cases, I don't. So be very conscious of when I explicitly say that and when I don't. Okay? Don't assume if there's, no, if there's not a percent in front of my statement about a confidence interval that it's 95. Okay? Only assume what I tell you in terms of these statements. Okay? So we've talked about the mean and proportion for uh, one sample. We've talked about two sample, difference between means, and so we're going to also talk about today the uh, difference between proportions. So this is not, we don't have a lot of new things going on here, but in terms of making decisions, when we looked at the mean, the difference between means, we had to decide, some sort of recap, we know that the mean is normally distributed with a mean of mu and a variance of sigma squared over n, right? So, what did we do with x1 bar and x2 bar? We had to come up with a new statistic. Right? This was going to be our best estimate for a difference between means. And this has a distribution. It's normal, mu1 minus mu2. And then this nice little thing over here. Does anybody remember what it is for the variance? Okay. Over n1, sigma2 squared over n2. So, this is nice, we have, and because we know these properties, we know that if we take a z-score, right, if we take x bar minus mu over sigma over the square root of n, this has a standard normal distribution, right, if we have something we have variables that are normally distributed, and we take a z-score of those variables, we are going to have a normal 0, 1 distribution. So this same idea applies here. If we have x1 bar minus x2 bar minus mu1 minus mu2 over this square root, This is also, oh, that's going to drive me nuts, sorry. is also normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. Okay, this is what, so when we're forming, th this is connecting this idea of why we care about the standard normal distribution, because when we, we know so much about it in terms of what, Z values correspond to important points, that if we can come up with a new statistic, like x1 bar minus x2 bar, that is going to allow us to do a lot of things in knowing, okay, if I find a critical value for the difference between these two variables, x1 bar minus x2 bar, and I standardize it, and it's 0.71, that standardized value of 0.71 here means the same thing that a standardized value of 0.71 means in this situation. So, we want, and so this is for means, okay, which we've talked about up to this point, and proportions are sort of the next thing we deal with. These are the two most common um, things we'll handle in this course, at least through the first part of it. So, thinking back to proportions, we came up with an estimate for a proportion. E hat, which is just a different way of signifying that it's an estimate. What kind of distribution did this variable have? 
Okay, normally distributed. It's okay to take a second to look back. This is, all this stuff is connected. So even though we have our quizzes that are weekly, we're, the reason for that is that we continue to build on these ideas. Um, well, we made some assumptions. So we built the idea of a single flip of a coin being a Bernoulli distribution. We built the idea of a binomial distribution being a sum of a whole bunch of Bernoulli distributions or a bunch of flips, right? But what happens with any statistic because of the central limit theorem is that if we have a large enough sample size and we look at the mean, it's going to be normally distributed, right? So if we do enough flips, even though our original variable is only like a zero or a one, it's a failure or it's a success. If we do enough of those and we look at the mean, that mean is going to be normally distributed. That's why the central limit term matters so much. So if we do it enough times, we um, come up with going to be normally distributed. And what do you think its mean is going to be? Peak. And what was the variance? Hint, you can look in this slide <laughs> to get information about that. So P times 1 minus P over N. Okay. So the same the same idea applies. So if we know that we have a normal distribution, right? This Z score was taking our statistic minus the population value divided by the standard deviation. Again, our statistic minus the population value divided by the standard deviation. Same idea applies here. So if I have our statistic, which is p hat minus p divided by the square root of p times 1 minus p over n, this is also going to be normally distributed. Okay, in all of these situations, we're just taking the z-score again. Okay, and we're using, to do that, we're using our statistic, population value, and or the population mean, and then the standard deviation. And so we have one box left to fill, so to speak, and it's going to be for a difference between proportions. So we need to decide should not surprise you that our best estimate is going to be p1 hat minus p2 hat. And we know that if we take enough observations, we should see something that's normally distributed. And so our task is to figure out what this distribution is. What are these parameters for the normal distribution? OK. So let's talk assumptions in terms of sample size. Here, we kind of assume that if we have 20 observations or more, we'll be good. What was the rule here for the two groups? Um, right now, we're just talking about the assumption. So this, we're just talking about when does the central li limit theorem kick in? Let's see if we can go back and find it. Way back. <laughs> 
All right. Yes, greater than 20, okay? But these are really, these are things that you have to have when I, on a quiz or on a midterm or things like that. This is the sort of thing that we just assume you know, okay? That these are important enough cutoffs that you should just memorize them, okay? Because it, it's not like they change for every situation. In this case, we care that n is greater than 20. In this case, we care that both groups have more than 20 observations. In this case, you guys remember how many observations we thought we might need. Is this, when you talk about how many we need, is that the same as how many we need to do the T test and how many T test? Is that the same? Or is it the um, same? Yes, this is where our cutoff, because when the central limit theorem kicks in, right, that is when the normal distribution kicks in. So this is a cutoff level for a decision about whether we can assume a normal distribution. If we don't meet the sample sizes, then we're dealing with a t-distribution. Okay. And I thought when between, it's like when between 20 and 50, it's kind of gray. Kind of gray. Uh, I wouldn't say up to, fit, no, it, it, if you get above 40, you are good. Um, above 30, it's typically going to be great in very unusual situations. Um, sometimes between 20 and 30, depending on the context, can be a little bit strange. But it's not a bad idea to just work under the assumption that if you get more than 20 in each group, that you should be fine. Okay. So again, it's not like our thresholds change a lot. Right? Here, we're just saying, okay, we need 20 observations. This just happens to be the mean. Right? Here, we also, same number of observations that we can use. Okay? We're going to introduce a couple of extra constraints in here that are specific to proportions. So, because the assumptions of the central limit theorem depend on the proportion, Okay, so just because you have more than 20 observations, it might be good, but depending on what the proportion is, it might not be. And so this is why we have these extra constraints, that n times p hat and n times 1 minus p hat are greater than or equal to 15. Okay, so in practice, if I say... Um, so if we go back to what p hat represents, do you guys remember this notation where we have it as the number of successes divided by the total number of trials, like if we're flipping the coin? So if p hat is something like, it just happens to be 0 0.5, okay? And so we have these constraints up here that n times p hat is greater than or equal to 15, and n times 1 minus p hat is greater than or equal to 15. So what should that tell us about what our n value needs to be if n times p hat needs to be greater than or equal to 15? 30. Okay, so what happens here is that you need to take stock of what um, p hat is. So if it's 0.5, then that's going to affect your sample size. What about if p hat was 0 0.05? So that would mean that 0 0.05 times n has to be greater than or equal to 15. Right? This is n. This is p hat times n, so 15, and this effectively turns into 15 times 20 if you do the division, so if we look at that, that is 300, okay? So what's going to happen is that as you get a more extreme, right, so whether p hat was 0.95 or 0 0.05, in one of the cases, I'm going to have to have 300, okay? Because if p hat is... 
p hat is 0 0.05 or p hat is 0.95. In one of these two cases, <laughs> n times p, n times 0 0.05 is going to have to be greater than or equal to 15. Question? So with p hat, it's a percentage. So if right, it is a percentage. Sides, like say you're doing male and female. Does n have to be the combination or n for each Can you one? say it again? One. So like if you're doing, so with the coin flipping, uh -huh. um, if you had, um, say it was 0.4 heads. Right. So you're looking for n of just successes, you're not doing the Well, combination. Well, this is exactly what this does. If When it has n times p hat or n times 1 minus p hat, it doesn't care how you define success and failure, right? Because if my p hat is 0.6, I'm still going to have to satisfy, right, so in this case, if I have a p hat of 0 0.05, n times 0 0.05 has to be greater than or equal to 15, and n times 0.95 has to be greater than or equal to 15. So if I have p hat equals 0.4, then n times 0.4 has to be greater than or equal to 15, and n times 0.6 has to be greater than or equal to 15. That is the total n. The so total number of smaller. flips. Yes, whatever's, yeah. you should pick whatever's smaller, but it's illustrated here because it doesn't, basically what this is saying if you read it, if we have n, uh, all right. so if we have this, if p hat is equal to s over n, then p hat times n, right, p hat times um, n, which is what we're trying to satisfy here, this is just equal to s over n times n, right, and this is just s, okay. So what you're going to see, what this really means is that the number of successes and the number of failures needs to be greater than or equal to 15. That's what this even though it looks like an equation that you're going to have to go through each time, it should be number of successes and number of failures is greater than or equal to 15. That's effectively going to give you the assumptions you need for the central limit theorem to kick in. Okay? And so this is not... Um, so what's different from the mean case is that how s the smaller or lo the more extreme, I should say, that p hat gets, whether that's closer to zero or closer to one, you're going to need a larger sample size for the central limit theorem to kick in. Does that make sense in terms of how this works? Okay. So in the case of the coin flip, where we have a fair coin, that is about as small of a sample size as we can get, and that's going to be 30 in that case. Okay. But as you start going to an extreme, it's much harder to, because you just expect to see fewer and fewer of successes or failures as p hat becomes larger or smaller. Okay. Yes, a small incidence is especially problematic. And so this is true when you are doing, um, and we'll get more into this over the course of the semester, but if you're trying to identify something or you're looking at something that is rare, um, you often are going to need a much larger population or sample size for your assumptions for your test to kick in. Okay, so I'm going to talk through this one for now in interest of um, just making sure we have time for programming at the end today. So if we have 50 newborn infants from obese women that are, are sampled, and 20 of them weigh less than 2,500 grams. Okay. So we are going to consider a success, right? I said this a couple of times when we first introduced the notation, that a success is not always associated with a good, out, a good thing. It just means the outcome occurred. So in this example, what would our success be defined as? Was less than 2,500 grams. And so what would our p hat value be? 0.4 be 20 divided by 50, right? Okay, so that is going to be, um, and so if we look at that with 0.4, what do you think we should look at? Just what we discussed. 
So is 50, and so we need to know is the number of successes and number of failures sufficient? Well, yeah, <laughs> it tells us this right here, right? 20, we have 20 successes and we have 30 failures. We're good, we met those assumptions, all right? Um, but in the case, and so we're, we're lucky here, but think about in the case where you were designing a study and you decided, well, I'm not going to pay attention to sample size before I design this study. And then you find out the thing you were studying is pretty rare. You are in trouble because you haven't met the assumptions for the test that you're doing. Okay, this is a very, it's very common for this to happen. And next week, Julian will start talking about power and sample size, which is really common, where if you don't pay attention to sample size up front when you're doing a study, um, you may as well... That what that usually results in is people don't have, they're not able to detect what they think they want to detect, and your study effectively is a waste of time. Okay, don't like to hear that, but it happens. So the interval is from 0.265 to 0.535. If you go through and use the um, 1.9 plus or minus 1.96 times the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. All right, so. What should this, if I wanted to interpret this interval, anyone want to take a shot at interpreting it? Okay, so here we are, so we haven't necessarily stated a test, but this is a good, you're going down a good line. So I formed the confidence interval, I've implicitly just done a bunch of hypothesis tests. All right, like I so let's if, let's think if I had done a hypothesis that I wanted to see is this um, is the proportion uh, equal to 0.5? So think about how I phrased it. The null in that case would be equal to 0.5. The alternative would be maybe not equal to 0.5. Do I have enough evidence to reject the null? One simple question. Is 0.5 in that interval? If your statistic is in that interval, what's the decision that you make? You fail to reject. Okay. So I know in this case, I'm really implicitly saying, so if I had done, if I had had a null of um, p is equal to 0.75 and the alternative is not equal to 0.75, I would do what? Reject the null. Okay, it's a very uh, confidence intervals give you a lot of power, and I would reject the null at what level? Ninety-five percent. Okay, so let's say that I started with this null hypothesis of h naught, and this is p is equal to zero point five, and an alternative is p is not equal to zero point five. So what can I say, looking at the confidence interval and knowing this is the test I did, what can I say about the p-value of this test? It's not 0.05, it's either greater than or less than 0.05. Well, there's only one definitive statement we can make. It's either greater than 0.05 or less than 0.05. We fail to reject, so it is greater than 0.05. Okay, we had adjusted this to say p is equal to 0.75, and p is not equal to 0.75. We had done this test. We know the p-value is less than 0.05. I see puzzled looks. What about it is not clicking for you guys? So you're saying the p-value is less than the confidence? Not the p-value. The proportion. proportion. Yes, this is where notation, you have to be very careful with notation. Okay, we're talking about a proportion. The proportion falls within that confidence interval. And okay. just like with a mean, if the mean falls in that confidence interval, in this case, zero is not what we're testing, we are going to do the same idea. If your statistic, if your null hypothesis 
falls in that confidence interval, you are going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So in this case, that's the point where it's 0.4. That's 0.4. And so because it falls within that known interval, yes. You fail to reject, and so you know the p-value is greater than 0.05. Okay. Um, can I make a statement about, is my p-value greater than 0.1? Yeah, you don't know. Right? If you know it's greater than 0.05, we don't have the 90% confidence interval here. I would need that information to be able to make a definitive determination. I do know... So if I reject at the 0 0.05 level, I'm sorry, I failed to reject, what would happen if I had a 99% confidence interval? So based on, so what would happen to this interval itself? Would it get narrower or wider? Wider. Wider. So more likely to capture the particular value. But we're still going to fail to reject, right? Because 0.4 is still contained in that interval. But when we go to a 90% confidence interval, the interval starts shrinking. And so we can't know for sure that 0.4 is still going to be part of that interval. Okay? This is, and so don't think for a second that this is supposed to click and be easy. This takes deliberate, like, thought. You need to really pay attention. So even if you're on the quiz, like, you will have more than enough time on the quiz for this weekend. But make sure, instead of just sitting down and saying, yep, 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 because you will recognize things, make sure you double check and think about, am I, when I'm thinking about this confidence interval, I almost draw, I still draw things out for myself, just to make sure that I'm convinced that my reasoning is, is right. Um, when it comes to, the most common error in the first half of this course is the comparison of 90 to 95 to 99% confidence intervals. And how they and what happens to their width. <laughs> it is a very easy mistake to make, um, and one that I really don't want you to. Okay. So we have this example. Hmm. Not sure what happened with the text here. So there's something. Instead of just ignoring the situation that comes up when we're dealing with uh, small sample sizes, we do have a way to deal with them. We do something that's called a continuity correction. Essentially what this means is you have this new, so P tilde, okay, and this is how P tilde is defined down here. What this does is we add two successes and two failures. That's why we see the y plus 2. So we've added two successes in the numerator. We've added two failures, and so the numerator is going to increase, or the denominator is going to increase by 4. We've added two successes and two failures. Just know that this continuity correction exists. Um, it's more accurate for small sample sizes than our like, traditionally calculated uh, confidence interval. And most of your software, both in SAS and in R, will apply this automatically, okay? especially in the case of small sample sizes. Don't worry too much about why it is like this. Just understand that this is going on. For small sample sizes, it has a remarkable ability to correct them by adding two successes and two failures. Question? So when we were talking about the PCAP stuff uh -huh. prior, S stood for successes, but now... Yeah, I'm sorry. That so Y and S should be interchangeable here. I'm sorry. Um, so basic, the numerator just refers to number of successes. Denominator is total number of cases or trials. Okay. And this is not something I'm going to ask you about on a quiz. This is just something that, for your own understanding... Um, Often if you do confidence intervals by hand for small sample sizes and then you run it in software, they will look a little bit different from each other. So you should be aware as to why that might be. It's not like you're doing something wrong. It's just that the software probably applied this correction that you did not. So I'm going to skip that for now. And this is... Um, 
this is more of what, and this should not say um, 10, it should say 15. Sorry, I adjusted, apparently this was where I collected all of my typos in this particular set of slides. Um, so I'm going to ask you to look through this one for yourself. So there are a number of, um, instead of devoting the time, this is another uh, one sample question. So what I'd like you to do in terms of looking through this problem, there's also a problem set three that is up on Moodle along with the solutions. Um, that will give you a chance where you're doing some hypothesis testing, both with means and proportions. Give you a sense of, as you're walking through these things, what's going on. If you have questions on those particular activities, I won't be here. Julian will have both classes next week. But if you have questions about those, just post them on the forum on Moodle. Like, I'll respond or Julian will respond just for clarification, okay? Okay, so to give you an idea of what happens, so when we're doing um, these things called corrections, or why we might not calculate exact p-values. So, in the past, we had to deal with computers that could not do a lot of computation. It's not so practical anymore. But 20 years ago, the computing power in one of the best supercomputers was more or less what we can do on an iPhone, right? Or something smaller. Um, so what we do is we often use the approximation to the normal being sufficient. And so this is true of binary data, right? Because binary data, it's a zero or it's a one, right? There's no, it's not continuous, it's not very nice. And so the question is, why don't we just do something directly with that instead of using this normal approximation? Well, it, it saves us a lot of computing time. Um, the approximation to the normal is often good enough, especially when we get to large enough sample sizes. And it's the calculation of the exact p-value is a little bit, and so it's phrased here, less transparent. Um, it's easier to understand where this p-value is coming from by taking a standardized approach here in all of these scenarios as compared with trying to explain what it does with an exact calculation. Because what happens, we've said that um, this p, right, the proportion, a single flip is a success or a failure. A sum of those, so that's the Bernoulli distribution, a sum of those is a binomial distribution. And so we actually know the exact distribution. We know it is a binomial distribution. So why do we go to a normal approximation when we could just do the exact calculation using the binomial? This is that question. And this is the reason for it, is it's a little more confusing to invoke and use the binomial distribution when we can just do something that works pretty nicely with the normal distribution. Um, if you've ever taken a class where you've talked about the binomial distribution, we know that we could figure out exact probabilities. Like if we know that the success probability of a success and the probability of a failure are like 0.4 and 0.6, we could figure out the exact probability of seeing four or more successes, or the exact probability of two or less successes. But we don't do that, and we use our approximation for these reasons. It's just something to be aware of. Um, that even though you're doing this, you're using an approximation. So this is just an example. If we were to, and again, this is not something that you need to um, like worry about for a quiz, but you should be aware of what's going on under the hood with this testing. So if we were to test this null hypothesis of 0.35, where the p is 0.35, the alternative is p is less than 0.35, and assume we've drawn a sample of size 12, and we find three people who have an event, right? So n times p0, or p0, is 12 times 0.35, it's 4.2. So we've broken 
We've certainly broken our assumption of it being compared to 15. It's less than 10 as well. So we have a small sample size. So think about what's going on here. When we're assuming we're talking about the normal distribution, we're assuming we have a large enough sample size so that the normal distribution can be invoked. Have a good rest of the day. Um, so what happens is that when we don't have a big enough sample size, what could we do? We don't just give up, though you might like to. Um, we can actually just use the binomial distribution itself. We can go get that exact p-value without having to do this normal approximation. And so basically the question we ask is, what is the probability of seeing less than or equal to three successes? Why am I saying less than or equal to three successes? Okay, so three successes out of 12 trials. Right, we're rounding down. Um, depending on the scenario, yes. It's, uh, th this is more just for illustration purposes, um, and we can talk about this more in depth. It's just in terms of ranking on where this falls in importance, it's not super high. Um, but you could use this function. You could ask, okay, the probability of this binomial distribution being less than or equal to three. And this is the code you could use in SAS, this is the code you would use in R, and that will kick out an exact probability. And remember, the p-value is only, a, it's just a probability. So instead of giving up and walking away, we've just said, okay, before we were using this pretty good approximation, now we're just gonna calculate, calculate it directly because we know the binomial distribution. And so this will give you the exact p-value. Um, this is here for your reference in terms of um, if you want to enter it in. It will very often in both SAS and R, <clears throat> you'll have to enter a statement about exact. Like in R, you'll say exact equals true. In SAS, this is how you'll state it. That's indicating it's using an exact calculation for the p-value instead of an approximation. Okay, so if you see exact show up, it's referring to, it's going to use the binomial distribution directly. All right, so after this slide, we're going to take a break. Um, we've covered a lot of stuff, right? This is a lot of, um, there's a lot of material, there's a lot of, there's a lot of formulas. What I, what I consider to be most important about what you walk out of this part of the course with is that you see the similar structures that are across these formulas, right? When we look at a confidence interval, we have three pieces that are there. We have our point estimate, we have our multiplier, and we have this measure of deviation, right? That is true whether we're talking about a confidence interval for mean or proportion, whether we're talking about a confidence interval for uh, one or two samples. That structure still exists. The same kind of structure applies here, where if we are able to understand how these... Um, these statistics are distributed, we can do something with them, and so we can compare them on similar scales. So in all of these scenarios, and this is the last one we'll talk about right after break, is that we can come up with a Z statistic in all of these scenarios, and it means the same thing. Whether we're doing proportions, means, whether we're doing one or two sample tests, this is, a, this is going to kick out a Z statistic. And if it's 0.71, that 0.71 means the same thing on all of these different scales, even though we're talking about different types of statistics. Um, this, so in terms of where this shows up um, in our examples, so for a confidence interval, um, so thinking about when we apply the continuity correction and the exact test, the continuity correction comes in the situation where we need to make our 
confidence interval, more accurate. And the exact test comes in the case where we're doing a hypothesis test and we don't have a large enough sample set. Okay, so think about it like that. When you think about continuity correction, which is adding two successes and two failures, that's going to help us make a better confidence interval when we have small sample sizes. And the exact test is going to help us when we have a small sample size and we're doing our hypothesis test. Okay. So we're going to pause here. Let's take um, maybe about seven or eight minutes and we'll come back and wrap up this part of the slide. I was going to tell you before the class, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to share. I'm supposed to be at this occupational yeah. therapy day at the Hill Rainbow. We have this class. That's fine. I asked a bunch of that, so I was the <laughs> phone contact. So I was one of the senator's offices calling me. So I was like, oh my God, I have to take this. And then they're like, you're in a physical therapy day on the Hill, right? And I'm like, no, occupational. I'm like, phone, can I get the computer for this? I'm like, cool, thanks. <laughs> He didn't say anything about the call. No. This is just he had at this point. This is the data that we have, right? So the null is we can come up with a null. We can say the null is p is twenty five, p is twenty six, whatever. Okay. So this is I've said this. There's not a hypothesis that's stated here, but we know that if our null value was within this interval at the point zero five level, we would get. No. We haven't said it. It's not said in the slide at all. I'm just saying if you have these 95 percent confidence interval, you know that if your null were in that confidence interval, right, any value in there, you would fail to meet that bit. Right? That's the reasoning I was trying to emphasize. That we haven't set up the hypothesis test, but because we've created a confidence interval, we know what we would do in a whole bunch of situations. So if P hat was point so let's say that this had turned out to be 40. Right? This is the data. We're using the data to evaluate the hypothesis. The data is not true in the hypothesis. So this is at 40, our p hat value is 20. And so based on the confidence interval, we would reject our null in that case. Because 0.8 is not in this interval. So this is Yeah, exactly. Well, you'd have a scenario in this case if you were doing the testing. Here it's just, it's just forming a confidence interval. There's nothing about hypothesis. But if you had a hypothesis beforehand of uh, it being, let's say you had a hypothesis up here, or you did it. Then if it was 0.5 or 0.52 or 0.45, and this is the data you had, this is the confidence interval you got, you would fail to reject it. I'm not failing to reject anything unless you came up with the thin end. I was just giving an example. If you had actually formed a hypothesis and it collapsed to that, it wouldn't be appropriate to go back and say, Okay, here's my null alternative now that I have the data. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the p hat value is from the data and that helps us, right? If we we're trying to use a sample to make a statement for this point. That's our, old, that's our overarching goal. This is the sample, and we're testing something about the population. Okay. Oh, yeah.
Yes, it's okay. just one sample test. Where do you want to do that? Yeah. So this was just, I know it's been a little while since we talked about proportions, so that's why I wanted to bring it back here. Like a small gas filter. Oh, yeah. Let's really get that one posted and then we have Two weeks with family? <laughs> I, did two, I did two and a half weeks with my dad and my sister last summer, and we drove to the Yosemite. We did the group to the Yosemite and go back, and we picked up my mom and my husband in Reno and dropped them in Vegas, and we went to the Yosemite party. My family knows better. Yeah. It's a we time have, have two and a half weeks together. Advance. Yeah, we have rules in place in advance of like the, the primary yeah. one is if you meet yeah. someone, if they were making you crazy, you could just be like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it actually went better than expected. Yes, two and a half weeks of dating. Did you guys? I guess I was just talking to you. Do you remember what happened last time? Tell me about it. Why do you think you would say, Paul, I don't live in New York? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
right? So in that case, it could be x1 bar minus x2 bar is greater than 3, or is, let's say, equal to 3, and you have an alternative test. It's like less than or greater than. It's not very common, at least for the type of stuff we're going to discuss, but you certainly could put a different value in there, right? Okay. Um, so again, this idea, um, this structure, is going to continue to show up. So when we talk about confidence intervals through the rest of the course, um, after spring break, we will talk about um, like measures, like, uh, let's see, we're going to talk about two by two tables. So we'll talk about relative risk, um, odds ratios. For all of those, we have confidence intervals for those statistics. They're going to look different. The calculations will look different in each case, but the structure of an, a point estimate, a multiplier, and a measure of error are going to show up in all of them. So just make sure that when you're looking at something new like this, you don't just look at all of the symbols. You try to break it down into what those pieces are. Because very rarely are you going to be doing this type of calculation by hand, but it's important that you understand where all of this is coming from. Okay, so we're taking this um, from an actual study. So we're looking at the effects of oral contraceptives on heart disease in women 40 to 44 years of age. We have 5,000 current oral contraceptive users. 13 of them developed a condition. I always love to make people actually say this word. Who wants to take a shot at saying it? All right, good. So I've had so many funny... Uh, experiences with people trying to like ask questions about it. Swear words have occurred in the second part of it. It's always been funny. Um, and among 10,000 uh, users who do not, non-users, seven developed the condition. Okay, so what it's a natural question to ask is the incidence of whatever disease or whatever it might be Right, this, I'm trying to think about how it might be more general. Is the incidence between these two groups different? Right, that's, and so we're going to ask a question about, it, are the proportions different between these two groups? Do we have enough evidence to say that? So what I want you to do for maybe take a few minutes, at least just set up the structure of the calculation, even if you don't want to type it in. So we have this information here. And we have this structure for the confidence interval here. I'd like you to just set it up. If, even if you don't carry it out and do it, just be comfortable with where you would plug these different values in. 
So if you're comfortable with just setting up the structure of the calculation, that's what I care about. Doing square roots and things like that, very easy, especially. It's, it's interesting from the transition, people in these type of courses used to always have like calculators, and now no one owns one because they have phones. Um, so I understand like you're not going to be doing a lot of this by hand, but I do want you to think for a second about this interval, about the confidence interval that's produced. So we discussed in our last class about, let's say that our null hypothesis is that there's no difference between these groups. And so we care about whether zero is part of this confidence interval. Okay, well clearly zero is not part of this confidence interval. But let's think about this. Is our p-value going to be like 0 0.04 or is it going to be like 0.00001? What do you guys think? Who wants to vote? All right, this is not a democracy in this class, apparently. Okay, we are going, so think about it. The p-value activity we discussed last time told us that we have to focus on the width of the confidence interval and think about how that width is related to a distance from zero. Okay, this is something that is going to be true here, is that it's really difficult when you get a lot of decimals, reasoning breaks down. Okay? So think about what that... So for our purposes, let's get rid of the decimal places. Because all that we said is that the width of the confidence interval as compared to how far from zero it is. So if we multiply everything by 10,000, we can just use this interval instead. Three... 35. Okay, so this is three units away from zero, right? And so we had this, let's say this represents three units up to three. 35 is going to be somewhere over here. So it's a p-value. What was the main conclusion we took away from that activity, if any? If the what? If the interval is smaller. If the interval is smaller relative to how far it is from zero. Okay, so in this case, this interval is 30, 32, can't do subtraction apparently, 32 units wide, and it's three units from zero. So you can imagine, it's not that unusual to observe a zero in this case. Remember that when we are forming this confidence interval for 95%, you can think about so if this is legitimately three here, we're gonna let's say I don't know. We're just gonna call it thirty-five. Um, so if this confidence interval is here, we know that what we really have here is a normal curve. That's the idea, that this confidence interval captures 95% of these observations. Well, it's not that hard to believe, if I actually drew this a little bit better, that we would have, some, have an observation of zero. But let's take a different scenario. Let's say we had um, a 95% confidence interval, and it was centered at 35, and it was centered at the same place, but let's say it went from, what should we do here? Centered at, so this one's centered at 19, right? If we had another confidence interval that was, let's say, from 16 to 22, and that was our 95% confidence interval, then it would look like this. In this case, seeing zero is almost impossible. In this case, seeing zero, while it might be unusual, it's much more likely than it is here. So our p-value is not going to be 0 0.00001. It's probably going to be a little bit larger than that.
So this is just something when you're going through this exercise. Decimal points are not your friend. They break things. It's, it's really hard to process them and think about them in the way that we do with integers. We have a good, in our head, we can compare 35 and 3. It's much more difficult to compare 0 .0003 and 0 .0035. Okay, so think about doing these type of shifts. And this, again, is just to emphasize, you should sort of expect what type of, you should think about what p-value you might see, especially if this case our null is that it's equal to 0. So if we have what you should have noticed, or maybe questioned a little bit, is we have small number of successes, right? In these cases, right? Our number of successes was 7 and 13. So certainly, in this case, below 10, we have a real problem. Um, we're going to apply a continuity correction, right? We just discussed this. In the case of one sample, we would add two successes and two failures. Here, we're adding one success and one failure to each group. Okay, this is that's all we're doing. And so we use these new calculations, and you don't necessarily have to worry about doing this. But what's happening here is that it's going to produce a better confidence interval. Okay, it's going to do that for small when you have a small number of successes and small number of failures, or small number of failures. When you say better, mm -hmm. exactly more better. accurate. It's cor so what happens with, so when we have small sample sizes, um, our assumptions about being able to use the normal distribution, they're problematic. Right? We said that when we're using a case where you have a success or a failure, and it's difficult with small sample sizes to use the normal distribution. This is trying to help us correct for that. So you get a lot of, you can form a confidence interval with small sample sizes, but it needs to be corrected because you're not, the sample sizes are not big enough initially so that you can actually use this normal uh, distribution and the properties of the normal distribution. Does that make sense? Like. So we're saying we need to make this a little more accurate. We know this is skewed or it's inaccurate in some way because we have too small, in this case, of a sample, too small of a sample size in terms of number of successes. And so this is just a correction that's trying to help us bridge that gap. Sorry. Question? With the single proportion, we're adding two successes and two failures. Yes. So the double yes, to each group. So we are adding, in both cases, we are adding two successes and two failures. We, in the second case, with two groups, we're just distributing those across the two groups. So when we're adding one, are we adding one? We're adding one success and one failure to both groups. So in the case before, it said y1 plus 2 over, or it said y plus 2 over n plus 4. You're still adding overall the same number of successes and failures, except in this case you're <coughs> distributing them across the two groups. You're giving each group one success and one failure. And that's helping us with our correction. So that would no. <laughs> you don't need to understand exactly why. And that would reflect in the confidence interval. The confidence interval is going to change. And of course, I mean in this case, the confidence interval didn't really change that much. Okay. But you will see this, often it can be a good idea, um, I mean if you run this um, on a, either R or SAS, it's probably going to, it's going to kick in this continuity correction anyway. So just understand that that's why your result, if you do it by hand, may look a little bit different from what you see in R or SAS. Question? And so when it's changing the confidence interval, making it better, is it Typical that it's just going to shift it away from the null, or it's going to get wider? It kind of depends. It, there's no, not necessarily uh, one right answer, at least as far as I know. Um, it's just going to be better that you have the continuity correction. So in this case, it moved it a very little bit, right? You can imagine that 
the p-value probably didn't really change that much here. Um, but it's possible, right? As so initially we were um, three units from here, and the confidence interval was essentially 12 times as wide as how far we were from zero. Now the confidence interval is nine times as wide, and or it's sorry, it's right from if we change it to four and 36. All right, we're four units from zero, and the confidence interval is 36 units wide. So, what? 33. Sorry. <laughs> and it must be near that time. Oh yeah, it's over 30. Um, this is like a combination of hunger and like everything else. I get out of here, I'm like ready to eat the nearest thing. So, um, so if we have this, so if we have this process, right, we can, and so just like the situations before, we know that if our null is that there's no difference between the proportions, we, when we look at the confidence interval, we want to know is zero contained in the interval or is it not? Okay. So, in terms of doing our particular calculation. So, if we're looking at a z-score in this case, it's going to look a little bit different, but essentially the same structure is we have our statistic, and this is the difference, zero is the difference under the null hypothesis, right? Remember that that second piece, or whatever goes here, is always what is your difference or expected difference under the null hypothesis? And this is just a measure of dispersion. Um, so the question is, why might this work? You'll notice that we're not, we haven't talked about assuming anything about sigma 1 and sigma 2. In fact, sigma 1 and sigma 2 don't even show up. Why do you think we haven't discussed sigma 1 and sigma 2? <coughs> Why have I not said anything about the variability as like a separate measure? Yes, it's built in. So, sorry, what were you going to say? I was going to say it's always going to be the same because it's either one. So it's one or the other, but what's most important in terms of our calculation is that if you look at the standard deviation and the variance, it only depends on P and N. There's no separate sigma here anymore, right? Whereas in this case, we had a mu and a sigma. Here, we only have to worry about the value of P because what's that say what that's saying is the variability of the standard deviation depends on the p on I don't want to say the p value depends on the proportion. Does that make sense? So we're not we're no longer worrying about this sigma one or sigma two or sigma. It's because we estimate the variance using p. Okay. So in this case, if our null hypothesis is true, so p one is equal to p two, that means that, and assuming that our sample sizes are relatively close, that means our variability and our standard deviation are going to be equal across the two. Is that, so if, so if P1 is equal to P2, which is typically going to be our null hypothesis, that there's no difference between them, well, our standard deviation only depends on P. All right, assuming that n1 and n2, or in this case, are not too far apart from each other. Well, that means we can more or less work under this assumption that we can pool the data. All right, before we had to make this, when we were talking about means, we had to make this decision. Can we pool or can we not? That's because sigma 1 and sigma 2 were extra parameters. Right? Now, if we know that p1 is equal to p2, and that the variance depends on P1 and P2, then we can more or less assume we can pool our variance. 
Okay, this is just something. So when you're working on, you're doing two sample hypothesis testing for proportions, and your null is that there's no difference. You are using this assumption of pooled variance because they are in fact the same. Um, that has nothing to do with it. So we're just we're just using. So this has nothing to do with deciding to reject or not. We are we're testing. So. When we do a test, it's always under the assumption of the null hypothesis, right? When we calculate the p-value, when we go through and do any of this stuff, we are saying the probability of observing this is as or more extreme than this under the assumption of the null is this probability. So whether or not it's true doesn't matter. It's that that is what our null hypothesis is, okay? So... We can pool the data to estimate common success, and that makes our variance equal across these two. So this is something that's a little bit different, but do understand that when we're talking about proportions, we no longer have this extra sigma parameter that we need to estimate. We're just estimating p. And when we estimate p, we are also estimating, as a consequence of that, the variance. Okay, that is something that is different between means and proportions. Question? Does that also assume that they're um, IDD? IID? Yeah. Yeah, so I know what you're saying. Um, okay, so if we think about, and so when you say when you say they are... The proportions? Cause, well. Right, so going back, thinking about our assumptions with Bernoulli, right, everything that we're doing here is made up of Bernoulli trials success or failure, we're assuming those are IID. Okay. Yes, so that, that assumption still holds here. Um, it's almost, in this class and even in the next class, in 6451 or Biostat 2, you are working under the assumption of IID. Um, if you violate independence, a whole bunch of things don't work any longer, and that's what um, correlated data is all about, so that's uh, the course number is 7430. But it's a, very, it's a very useful course, because when you are looking at things where um, this independence assumption breaks down, which happens a lot in this field, where we track people over time, for example, it's useful to know what to do in those cases. Okay. So, in terms of assumptions about when we can do this, we would like, if we split across these groups, the number of successes and failures in each group to be at least five. Okay, don't worry again about why that threshold is different. Just know that if we're doing this and the number of successes and failures in both groups should be at least five. <clears throat> and then you're going to proceed as before to do the p-value. So, okay. I'm going to pause on this, um, other than to say on this, so this is just an example to get you thinking, and it tells you what sort of result you should get if you followed through it correctly. Um, but these last, um, this last, these last couple of slides are important just to tie this material up. Um, question, first question you should really be asking when we're talking about summarizing confidence intervals and hypothesis tests. So if we can summarize what we've talked about for four weeks, right? you're going to ask questions. Are my data continuous or are they binary? Right? Is my outcome measure continuous, like height or weight, or is it a success or failure? That's the first question to ask. Is my sample size large or small? If you have a large sample size, usually, so usual Z, you have continuous data, with known variants of the population or binary data, or you're going to use the t-statistic continuous data with unknown variants in the population. Uh, if you have a small sample size, you're going to use the t-statistic for continuous data, and you're going to use the continuity correction or the exact test with binary data. So what's happening here is that if you can reasonably get a large enough sample, you don't have to worry about a lot of this 
this continuity correction or the exact tests and things like that. But in a field like public health, where things come up when we have things that are quite rare in terms of incidents, these do happen often enough that you need to be aware of them. Um, we can ask in a two sample problem, are the variances the same or are they different? So if, in terms of whether they're the same or different, we just talk about a special case with proportions where if the null is that there's no difference, that as a consequence means we're assuming pooled variance. But when we're talking about the means, more or less, you are going to work under the assumption that you need good evidence or a good reason to believe that the variances are equal to each other. Okay, so some general words of warning. We put caveats in, in statistics. The best thing you can say is that it depends. People ask, what do I do in this case? It depends. Why? Well, it depends. Um, it's, just it's like <laughs> talking, I'm pretty sure that's how I, how I like drove my parents nuts for the first like 10 years of my life. Why? Or, and they would just say it depends. And I would keep continuing to ask why. It's just a bad circle of feedback. Um, some things to watch out for. Non-independent groups. Okay, So you should have a reason to believe that there's independence between the groups. Um, software defaults. So I have checked into this more in the latest versions of SAS and R. I believe, as far as I've been able to run, that both SAS and R default to doing two-sided tests. So if you don't specify one or two-sided, it's going to do a two-sided test. Okay. Um, equal versus unequal variances, they will both default. Again, this is as best as I've been able to document, that they default to unequal variances, and you have to specify equal variances if you have a reason to believe that's true. Um, pretty much all the time, just assume unequal variances, more conservative assumption. Um, it's a reasonable thing to do. We can use the binomial exact test for one sample problems with binary data. That was just back to that example slide. Um, and perhaps the biggest caveat, the required sample size guidelines, these are rules of thumb. Okay, And so rules of thumb are notoriously non-applicable across every type of field. So you might be in a scenario or a situation or a type of research where things are different. So often you can gain some insight into what sort of sample sizes are required, what's typical in your field, by reading. <laughs> Read the papers, understand what other people have done, see what kind of sample sizes they're dealing with, and what kind of results they've had from using those kind of sample sizes. That is, in addition to the rules of thumb, a really good idea to pursue. Okay? So that kind of, um, in terms of material, that ends so the confidence intervals, hypothesis tests, those don't go away. They show up in all sorts of forms as we continue to go. Um, what Julian will pick up with next week, so we're going to take the last 20, 25 minutes here to talk about programming. Um, but he will pick up and talk about uh, type 1 and type 2 error in hypothesis testing. And so if those of you are in statistics or Generally speaking, I've read some papers, you might have heard those terms before. Power, type 1, and type 2 error, um, things like that, as well as thinking about determining power in a study and why it's important. So that will be kind of the focus of next week. Okay? All right, so I'm going to...